in, in Romans 10, 17, it says, you know, faith comes by hearing, and this is King James, I'll quote for a song, and hearing by the word of God. And um, God spoke to Abraham. He told him to, first of all, uh, leave his father's home and his place, go 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 where he would show him. So, and he went out not knowing where he would go. We know all of Abraham's story. So the word of God coming to, to Abraham imparted the faith. He trusted God. I prefer the word trust because faith can sometimes refer to the Christian faith or stuff like this. But faith is, as I see it, is, is, um, is like love. It's a fruit of the spirit. It is God himself, really, his spirit within us. That, that's how we get the faith and the trust. So in, in Romans 4.22, Abraham was viewed as having been brought into a righteous existence, not a, 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 uh, a sort of a courtroom sort of uh, uh, pronouncement that, oh, he was considered... Yes, it does say that he was considered righteous or, or justified and so forth. R by the way, uh, righteousness and justifications are two English words that translate the, 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 the one Greek word. They're the same thing. And it's confusing sometimes where uh, the common translation will say righteousness, other, word, other times justification, when it's the same word. And so there's been a long history of of uh, the idea of righteousness being something that, oh, how we act. Well, that's involved in it because how we act because uh, is uh, you can even have your own righteousness. Paul had his own righteousness out of the law, you know, but that was part of something that he left behind, considered that refuse, you know, the old things had passed away. And now it was the righteousness of God, which is a righteousness which is God. That is imparted to us through his word, by his spirit. Now, in Romans 4.24, Paul uses the term us. He is speaking corporately. Just want to point that out there, that you would, uh, when you read through, you'll, you'll notice that. In Romans 4.25, Christ was handed over because of our sins, corporately, and was raised up uh, through or it could be read because of our um, justification. That's the, the common word used. But I, I like um, uh, Douglas Campbell's uh, word, eschatological deliverance. Uh, being, or, or as, as uh, Rudolf Bultmann liked the term, right-wised, being turned in the right direction. That's what right-wised mean. Uh, Tom Wright likes the idea of being righted. So it's something that God does to us, not just something that, that he determines like, uh, you know, a, um, a forensic uh, attitude of, well, okay, because of Christ, I'm going to consider you justified. I maintain that it's something that God does to us and changes us. He puts us in Christ, and Christ is as First Corinthians says Christ is our righteousness, you know. Now, if, if we have Christ within us and we are within Christ, the two things, then that is what makes us right, puts us, the word righteousness or justification literally means from the, the word uh, to be right uh, came from uh, the Sanskrit into Greek. And it meant, originally meant to point, and then it became the way pointed out. And Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the way that, uh, that Abraham was righteous. He's the way that we are righteous or justified or in the way pointed out, turned in the right direction, which is toward the Father. That's where he is leading us. Christ came to lead us to the Father. Um, on page, um, no, I'm sorry, I'm reading my notes here. Um, I want to read... A, uh, a passage from First um, uh, Corinthians one thirty, where it says, "Now you folks are and continuously exist being 
forth from out of the midst of him. Listen to that statement. And this is a literal running. We are. We continuously exist forth from out of the midst of him, meaning Christ. Within and in union with Christ Jesus, who came to be in and among us from God, both a right wising eschatological deliverance into righted covenant, covenantal existence in fair relationships of equity in the way pointed out. Now, what I've done, I've conflated the meaning of dikaiosene righteousness from a number of scholars, from N.T. Wright to um, well, just, uh, just a number of, of, of scholars that I've already mentioned. So, into and uh, a being set apart or being made holy, being dedicated, you could say to, uh, uh, to be different, even a redemptive uh, uh, liberation. That's First Corinthians one thirty. Now, uh, in um, I want to read another. Th- uh, scripture from Paul uh, in 2 Corinthians 5.21 uh, because Paul is u- uses different terms but from my studies I, I'm coming to believe firmly that many of these things are just different pictures different word pictures speaking of the same thing the Christ event and what Christ has done for and in humanity in uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, he's, he's talking about what's normally considered the term um, reconciliation. That, that noun with its corresponding verb is based on the, the, the root meaning to be other. So with that in mind, let me read my expanded translation of verse 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For you see, he made or he formed, or he makes us the one not at any point knowing failure um, by intimate experience uh, to take, you can, I'm supplying a verb here because there's not one in the Greek text, to take the place of or to be failure over us and our situation, or he constructed as a sin offering, this could be read to uh, based on the the words use in the uh, in the uh, Old Testament, for our sake, the person who is not at any point having an experience experiential knowledge of missing the target or making a mistake, so he, meaning God, made Christ to be this to the end that we may be birthed or come into existence. Being it's a it's a word. Greek word there that means to come into existence, to ha- can be, to happen. But in this case, it's for us to, to be birthed, to come into existence, being God's right wise qualities, God's right relationship with fair and equitable dealings, which accord with the way pointing out and so forth. Within him and in union within him, with him is another way of expressing the preposition there, either within the midst of or in union with and so forth. So this is all about being in Christ, and it's a new existence, which which, um, in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Paul calls a new creation. And that's what we are. And he says, the old has passed away. What did he mean? Did the world end? No, no. He was, the the first creation was the, uh, really, when they, when God created Israel as a nation, with the first covenant in Mount Sinai. Now we are into a new covenant, a new creation, where he is making all things new. And in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Paul says that the old things have passed away. The, the arrangement of the old covenant has passed away. Behold, new, the new has come. So as a background to chapter 5, um, I'll, I'll I'll move to um, to to Romans five, and actually just to keep make things flow a little easier, because my expanded translations 
when you're speaking, sometimes it can get a little lost. I've put all the things in there, just a, a word on my translating is the, the different nouns can be in, in, in noun cases that can have it in an inflected, inflected language like Koine Greek was, it can have different functions depending on the context. It can mean have different nuances or meanings. And the translator goes through, looks at the context, and will decide usually on just one. But I found fi uh, most of the time there's multiple functions that a particular noun case, I'm just fo focusing on nouns for the moment here, that can serve. And therefore, uh, you read the passage through one way and it can show you this picture. You read it through with a different function. It's like moving to another side, looking at the same mountain. Oh, it's the same, saying the same thing, but it's saying it a little differently. So um, that's why there, I, I said, well, these other potential functions, if they make sense to the context, should be available to the reader for the Holy Spirit to speak to each reader as you read the passage to really come to an understanding. And um, when they narrow it down, giving just one, um, it will, it, it just sim simply limits our view. We're only seeing one picture of the mountain rather than seeing the whole entire mountain, which if you it, go all the way around the mountain, it will look slightly differently, even though you realize it's the same mountain. I think I've made my point. So I'm going to read from King James because my translation is a study translation to read and contemplate slowly, and, and often it won't. But most of you sh should be familiar enough with King James to follow this. So I've been talking about justification uh, in my expanded translation and so forth. I hope you followed that. Well, chapter 5, verse 1 uh, says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God to our Lord Jesus Christ. So chapter five starts out with that background of chapter four about justification and, and Abraham and faith. That was an example Paul took from Israel and he took one man and, and he used him. And you, we find in, in the letter to the Galatians, you know, that, that we are, we're Abraham's seed. We're part of him, you know, and we're part of the promise. The scriptures, God usually through the writers of the scriptures mostly dealt when, when God was making a dealing with for humanity, he was he was speaking primarily corporately of the large group. And we'll run into this in just a, a little bit when when we start with uh chapter or verse 12 of chapter 5 here but even even what i read out of uh, second corinthians there's he's speaking corporately and the christian religion made everything subjective of something you individually make now we do come to life individually but Paul, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, you know, it's every man in his own order or group or class and so forth. It's, 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 it's people are constantly being born and they, in the, in the lifetime of being here, having been born, you move in, you need to move into, into Christ individually. But Paul's view is, is broad, very broad. And we'll find very soon here, he starts talking about Adam. He starts talking about two people, and yet two people represent the whole of mankind. So here Paul is starting out, okay, he's talking about us. We have peace with God. And the word peace, I also translate in my later translations, my, my translation has grown over the years just with continued study and reading scholars and so forth. But the word peace comes from the word, the verb that means to join. Uh, I, I, lear I learned that through Kenneth Wiest. Um, but, um, and so he's brought, we have peace and a joining. You see, we are joined to the vine. We are joined a member of Christ. And in, in, if you, ha you need to have this concept of how Paul was thinking to understand what he's saying that. 
Well, go, moving on, by whom we have access, by faith and this grace we stand and rejoice in the hope or better expectation of the glory of God or from God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations. Boy, that's a word. <laughs> That is a, a statement for our day, isn't it? <laughs> Trials, pressures. And then he goes through from verse 3 through 5, a, a progression of, of at, attributes and, and um, that are really attributes of God. You know, they are the, um, uh, starts out with uh, uh, patience uh, pa uh, and then uh, expectation of hope and, and so forth. He goes on through these things that come from our new situation of being justified. I'm going to skip ahead here to um, verse 6, where it says, For we were yet without strength. And Ephesians 2.1 says that we were dead, dead in trespasses and sins. Now, he's not speaking physically there, obviously, but we were dead to Christ. We were dead to the life of Christ, that, that intimate spiritual relationship where uh, the, the branch is joined to the vine and the sap is flowing from the, the vine into the branch, producing the flower, producing the fruit. And in John 15, Jesus said, I want you to bear fruit. That's what he wants us to do. And what is that fruit? It's the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5. It's the fruit of God himself that can, and other metaphors where like Jesus used the sower, you know, planting a seed. The seed is a word. God plants the word in our hearts, in our spirits, and thus we become uh, the ground that produces, once again, the word. The life of God, Christ. We that's why we have the anointing. And so these things are brought to us through the work of God. This is all about the work of Christ and the work of the through the work of the Holy Spirit within us. All right. Um, so in verse eight, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Okay. See uh, the us there once again, think corporately that he's speaking about here. Just take note on, on the, the plural things. Uh, some, some commentator says, oh, well, that's just he's speaking us in a sort of uh, linguistic thing of, of us. Like we often write, I often write we so that you keep the I out of it. But here he's using this consistently. What has happened to us? And this is while we were sinners. This is what Christ did. Christ died for us. And, uh, and then verse 9, much more than. Notice much more than, because he will use that word more again. We were enemies. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Skip down. Being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from, from wrath through him. I want to point out there that the word God is not in verse 9. We're not saved from the wrath of God. That's a, a uh, an interpretation that's been introduced to it. Oh, and they think, well, the wrath is hell and all this and that. No, we're saved, and it's actually from, means from out of the midst of. We're saved from our current situation. And I won't go into the word wrath, but... It, this could, could well be we're saved from human wrath, meaning even the wrath within ourselves, because this is what the transformation is about. And we've all experienced these things. We have to be delivered from that is from that is within us. Move out farther corporately. We have to be delivered from the thinking, the the anger, and so forth of, of the society that we live in, and. Uh, we just look around, we see, boy, that's, that's high, going on today in a very strong way. He's come to deliver us from out of that, to where we're living. We've been, 1 Corinthians, or no, Ephesians 2, 6. He has raised us up. We've experienced a resurrection into the one who is the resurrection, 
and the life, like Jesus told Martha, I am the resurrection life. We're, we're, the kingdom is not of this system. It's, it's above, this, above the earth. We're in, in a higher realm of living. And we, he has caused us to ascend into him in this way. Out of the wrath that is below the death realm, where we were dead in trespasses and sins, into this new living existence. Um, you might say, well, Paul used the word, he says, awake thou that sleeps and Christ will give you life. That's, that's what's happening here. So, and then verse 10, for if we were enemies, we were reconciled. And the word reconciled is the same that I read in, in early, uh, a bit ago in 2 Corinthians 5, 19 and 21, on 18, 21 there. It literally means the base of that word. It can be said we were made to be uh, turned from being enemies to friends. Well, that's, that's one of the results. But the, the root idea of the word that is translated reconciled both here and in 2 Corinthians is other or to be another. It's, so, and this is, this is in the passive voice when it says we were reconciled, we're, the passive there means that God has done this. Uh, the uh, theologians call this the divine passive in, in the New Testament primarily. It means that God worked on us and, and changed us. He made us to be other than we were. That is the real idea of what's translated reconciled, which I think is a very anemic translation. But when you realize he's talking about that we were made to be other than we were, that's, that's the new man. That's the resurrected man. That's the, the state of living in a higher realm, a higher vision, a higher awareness. So uh, moving on here, we shall be saved or delivered or made whole in his life. Um, another thing that it took me a while to I'll, I'll be, uh, actually get the courage to, to start translating the future tense as a uh, durative tense. I knew it, but nobody was translating the future as a durative tense, but it is. And you can check A.T. Robinson's huge volume that is classified like the uh, um, present tense, which I'm all, often putting in the words continuously or progressively or habitually. It's, it's durative action. They call it durative. It gets ongoing. The, um, the imperfect tense is that way too. But also the future tense is that way. In fact, on, on regular verbs, the endings for the um, future tense and the endings for the present tense are the same. There's just a sigma that is inserted between the stem, verb stem, and the, the, uh, the ending of the word. And so um, the concordant version indicates it by a little superscript that it's a a, a future tense, but they don't translate it out to where the reader, unless they know Greek, will, will not pick up on that. So I'm saying that to say we shall continuously or progressively be delivered. And we find in this life, this is an ongoing process of deliverance from the self, uh, deliverance from uh, wrong attitudes or perceptions into seeing even even to the seeing that we are one humanity, I mean, we are one people, which Paul brings out in just a few verses here, because he uses the symbols, just like he uses Abraham to, to be a symbol of those who are of faith. He used Adam, and then he uses Christ, and I'll move on there to not take too much time. Now, And not only so, but we were also uh, joy in God, through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. Now, well, that's King James. Um, let me read that verse in uh, my own translation. 
I obviously did the translation because I found the common translations just totally inadequate. And not only that, but further, we are, we are now folks constantly celebrating, speaking loudly and boasting within and in union with God through our owner or Lord, Master, Jesus Christ, through whom we now receive the aforementioned act of being changed from enmity to friendship. Or, and King James used atonement there, so they've added a different word from just, justification, but it's the same. The full exchange of being changed to be in line, consistent, and compatible, where we are totally other than we were. The reconciliation. I include that so people will kind of clue in. That's what it's talking about. The commensurate exchange, the change, uh, it, and I insert, induced by the action of God, which came down upon us. So this now is, is what was happening in verse 11. And I've, I, I went back there. But um, wherefore, now, wherefore means like because of this, because of all that he has said, because of all that Christ, that God did through Christ, as by one man, and that man is Adam, sin entered into the world, and death by sin and so death passed upon all men. You know, they're, they're still living, but they're not in that garden life where they have the intimate fellowship with God. They're not joined. They're not connected. They're not whole. They're dead. When, they, when Adam ate of, uh, of the tree that, um, and became disobedient, he was ushered out of the, out of the garden uh, experience. And we, I won't go into that. But anyhow... Um, for that, all have sinned. Now, that last phrase in King James, for that, or because all have sinned, is, is an incorrect translation. There's a, a kind of a unique in Paul um, expression here. It's a preposition upon and followed by the particle, which means which, upon which. And um, reading reading on um let's see if i'm in the right place okay i need to find verse 12 and um i wrote too much <laughs> because and, and i'll read the whole of verse 12 but by trash because of and through this or therefore this is why just as through one man one person in this case the sin and there's the definite article there. It's not just sin in general. The sin entered into the aggregate of humanity or the world. But when it talks about the world, mostly it's not talking about the earth. It's talking about uh, the systems of man or else just mankind himself, the aggregate of humanity, the ordered system of religion, culture, society, government, and so forth. So the sin... And that means the failure, the miss of the target, literally. It's an archery term. Um, uh, entered into the whole of human culture and into the aggregate of humanity. And through the sin, still talking about Adam's sin, um, the death. And this isn't just death in general. It's the death, the particular death that had happened with Adam and Eve when they were cut off from the fellowship, face-to-face -face fellowship with God in the garden experience. And that garden was symbolic. Uh, well, I won't get it. Um, anyhow, that, that is the death that was talked about where Ephesians says, we were, we are dead. We were, we're dead in trespasses and sins, but he has raised us up. There's a resurrection there. So, <clears throat> And then verse 12, in this way, the death thus also passed through in all directions or came through the midst causing division and duality and went throughout into all mankind or into the midst of humanity to all people upon which, see it's upon which refers back to the antecedent of upon which 
is the death upon which uh, all people sin. Now that's the aorist tense, often translated as a simple past tense, but also can be translated as a simple present tense. It's because of death, the realm of death that people are living in, they're, they're blind to the, the light, they're, they're, um, they're, they're dead not realizing that they're connected to other people, that, that mankind really is one, which Paul is really bringing out in this collective uh, teaching here, that we are one, you know. And because of this, uh, being dead to that, that I don't see that I'm joined to you, that I make the failure. I make a division between us. I say, well, wait a minute, you've done this and that. And we miss the mark of the love that we were in, intended to reflect. God's love, which is acceptance, unconditional acceptance. And, and, uh, and Paul Tillich brings out that this agape love is acceptance of another despite their demonized state. And he uses the word demonized in the sense of distorted. And that's what we see. We have somebody uh, physically dead. They <laughs> fall apart, you know, event in the grave and so forth. And their image is distorted, everything. And <clears throat> the po a, a huge problem is reading the scriptures without understanding the great amount of of metaphorical language that is used. And there was a tendency, especially since the oh, Enlightenment coming that uh, of the 1700s, was it? Whenever that, oh, we have to read everything literally, take it literally. And then that led Christianity on a very, a very bad path. So moving on and uh, reading the next uh, verse 13, for until the law, sin was in the, in the world or within the aggregate of humanity, but the sin was not imputed or, or, or credited to them where there's no law. In other words, where there's no law, there's no blame, there's not whatever. Nevertheless, verse 14, death, the death that he's talking about uh, here that came through the one man, death reigned acted as king from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the likeness of Adam's transgression. And then it says, who is a figure, and the word means like a type, an imprint of him that was to come. In other words, Adam was a type of Christ. How? In his sin? No. He was, he was a symbol as the, for all humanity. Adam represented humanity in, in, in Scripture. And Paul brings up this, if you want to read 1 Corinthians 15 from about verse 44 on, he says, <clears throat> he refers to the first man and the second man. Uh, the, uh, uh, I forget the others, there's uh, two categories there, but the, uh, the first man, Adam, and the last, there's the second man, and there's also the eschatos. And he's talking about the, the first, the, the literal, the physical, you know, or the carnal, whatever, the Adam nature of the first, and then later the heavenly nature of the spirit in, in the second. So I'm diverging there for a little bit, and I'll try not to go too much longer here. But <clears throat> reading ahead, um, verse 15. But not as the offense, so also the free gift. For if through the offense of the one, that's Adam, now King James says many, and one of the few places where I like NIV better than King James actually put the definite article in there, and it means the many. And it's a phrase we will see each time he says many in King James, it is the many. And scholars just said, that's the mass of humanity. <clears throat> For if through the, the offense of, of one, the many be dead, much more, much more, the, not just 
a few, but the grace of God and the gift by grace, uh, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto, or that could be read into, the many. So we have two categories here. The many that were in Adam and the many that are in Christ. And, and, and hopefully you'll see this, this coming here. <clears throat> we have Adam and Christ, two representative figures in Paul's thinking, which was the, the Jewish thinking of the day, that it's like, it's like you, you go back through the Old Testament, you'll find that David sinned and the whole, all of, all of Israel was punished. You know, God re did dealings with certain individuals that were key individuals in this special history of Israel and on into his Christ's body and so forth. <clears throat> what happens to the one happens to all. And we see here that the all is actually all humanity. It happened with, with Adam, same happens with Christ. So, verse 16, and not as it was by one sin, so is the gift, for the judgment or the decision, judgment really means just a decision by one who is judging, was by one to condemnation, but the free gift of many offenses unto this word justification that I talked about earlier here, this turning in, in the right direction, this um, anti right likes, likes the term covenant inclusion and in participation, and others meaning being having right relationships. And I think that was Barclay, who was one of those within Barclay. So I, I brought these different theological understandings together in my expanded translation. But um, I, I would rather say here in verse 16, unto Christ's eschatological deliverance of humanity. Eschatological, because it was the end of one age. It was, it was God entering into human affairs and arranging a whole new system. The old covenant passed away. And the word covenant means arrangement. The old arrangement passed away. No more animal sacrifices. Like Paul, uh, Jesus said to the woman in Samaria, that won't worship here in this mountain, nor either in Jerusalem, but in spirit and truth. That's the two covenants right there. From the literal, physical realm into the spirit, which Paul then brings to where we are the temple of God. God lives within us. We are God's own little aside there. So from many, uh, out of many offenses of all of humanity, you see, into a, a uh, being turned in the right direction, or if, if we call it reconciliation, that term that he uses, I think is he's talking about the same thing, just like Jesus used many different parables to talk about the same kingdom. Paul uses different words to talk about the same thing. It's all the work of Christ all the work of Christ, all the way through. Um, okay, I have a, a time. <laughs> Linda showed me what time it was. <clears throat> well, don't know what your time frame is. Oh, yes. I, so, um, all right, 17. For if by one man's offense, death reigned. See, this was, a, this was where we've been transferred out of the, the reign or the uh, authority of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son, where he says elsewhere. So <clears throat> then he says, much more, they which receive the abundance of grace <clears throat> and of the gift of righteousness or eschatological deliverance of being rightwise turned in the right di direction. That's what he does. This is not a court pronouncement. It is something that actually happens to people each of them coming to it within their own time in their life, when, when the Spirit of God awakens the seed that's been planted. <coughs> but uh, the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. So here is where he says definitely Jesus Christ in, in contrast to Adam. 
17, again, for if by one man's offense death reigned, much more justification shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Then verse 18, therefore, as by one offense, by the offense of one, judgment uh, came upon all unto condemnation, even so by the righteousness or the eschatological deliverance, the being turned in the right direction, the being placed in the way pointed out, of one came upon all humanity, all men, all people, unto justification of life. The same thing, he's repeating himself over again. This, this justification of life and, and the being in the way pointed out, which is faith in, in, in my in my view, chapter four, where uh, uh, the, the, the one justified uh, by faith shall live, there's, I, I see that justification, that being turned in the right way as b basically a definition of a life by faith. I'll just throw that out without trying to prove my point. But so, unto justification in life upon all men. See, all men, that's the same thing as the many back in these other verses. The many, the whole of humanity. For as uh, by verse 19, for as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, made to fail. So by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. And here I would add the word shall many progressively or one after another shall continue being made righteous and we become the righteous of another i think it's corinthians we we become the righteousness of god we become the way pointed out the way that jesus said i am the way that's what we are to become we are his fruit we are his children we are his sons and daughters <coughs> So, so the many will be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, it could grow more. It, the law and those who try to live by Moses' law are making the, the offense, the disobedience spread because you can't keep, keep uh, the law in the way that brings deliverance in life. Uh, but where sin abounded or abounds, grows more and it spreads, grace did much more abound, or much more does. That as sin hath reigned in death, even so might Christ reign through righteousness, through the way pointed out. You see, he reigns through the way that we follow him who is the way. And by he reigns by our being connected as branches to the vine. This is all the work of God, and we are living it out, and we pass it on. We, we share it with others. Others eat our fruit, which is his word, and then they come into it. So through this, this deliverance that is brought, this being turned in the right direction, placed into the waypoint out with covenant, covenant participation with the whole body and with Christ <clears throat> unto Ionian life by Jesus Christ, our Lord. The tree of life. The tree of life. Very good, Linda. <laughs> the, the tree of life. It, it's, all, it's all such a beautiful picture. And... Uh, I just maintain that this, this chapter from four on through, and then on through from uh, six, seven, and eight, he, he just embellishes, sh sheds more understanding. But this chapter five is the core and the high point of Paul's doctrine of the good news. Thank you. <laughs> Thank Any you, Jonathan. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm going to do a, a quick screen share for every. Okay, we're going to go right down to Romans, starting in verse 12. I don't hope you can see this. Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sin. 
Uh, nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, which is a type of him who was to come. Then verse 15, but the free gift is not like the offense. For if by the one man's offense, many died, much more the grace of God, or the many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many or to the many. And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned, for the judgment came from the one offense, resulted in condemnation to all, but the free gift which came by from many offenses committed by all, okay, I put that in, in my own brackets there, resulted in justification for all, or it makes no sense. That's what I was saying. It, you know, if, yeah. it, 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 if what happened in Adam affects all, it doesn't make any sense that what happened to um, to Jesus would not affect all, especially in the context of much more. Um, yeah. If you noticed, I've highlighted the word much more in this section three times um, in verse 15, in verse 17, and of course in verse 20. And so we'll, let's just continue on now. And um, so for by the one man's offense, death reigned through the one, much more will those who, uh, will those receiving um, uh, uh, David Bentley Hart, uh, will those receiving all do receive. That's the point here we need to understand. Okay. Abundance of grace and of the grace of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. Even so, through the one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in right wiseness of life, as Jonathan would say, or justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so also by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. In other words, I think we're looking at, like John is saying, we're looking at plurality. I mean, singularity, singularity versus plurality. And the one Adam affected all human beings. The life of the one Christ affects all human beings. You can't have all in Adam and not have the same all. Uh, otherwise, it, 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 the whole thing falls apart. It certainly would not be much better or much more uh, um, of an accomplishment that Christ has done. But like, for example, right here, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace um, would may reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So Excellent. I just wanted to, sh to share that. So Jonathan, does, does that summary, or could you uh, fill in any- That's very good, that's very good. Does anyone have a, a question for Jonathan while, while we still got him? Is that Sparky? Thomas, Sparky. Mm -hmm. You'll have to unmute yourself. Now, if, if we can keep our questions fairly short to the point, uh, because I don't know how much time we'll have with Jonathan Mitchell, so um, longer comments can come a little later on in our meeting. This this was it wasn't going to be a question. It was going to be a comment about Christ. Um, you may hold it for for later, Jerry. I mean, if, if, yeah. Well, let's keep our comments to like a minute or thirty seconds to a minute. Okay. Yeah. Um, all all I wanted to say was, um, I I don't think. Uh, most people understand Christ as the creator, John chapter one yeah. of the universe. Yeah. What a little human Adam could do in damaging, in a sense, yeah. all mankind. Are you kidding me? The yeah. creator of the universe can't correct it. Okay, I'm done. There's my 30 second. Just say. <laughs> Excellent. Well said. Thank you. Very well, Thomas. Roger. Uh, yes, uh, Jonathan, verse 17. For if by the uh, transgression of the one death reigned through the one, much more those who receive. 
receive the abundance of the grace, et cetera, et cetera. What's your thoughts on uh, that about those who receive this grace? You know, the work of Christ is both corporate and individual. It, it happens to us individually. We have to, re, we have to be uh, soil, shall we say, that receives the seed. Go back to um, the parable of the, so, the sower. You know, the seed was the same everywhere, but there were different soils. You know, and, and if the soil is not there, is it needs to be worked on. And uh, some, of, some of those soils that were overgrown with brambles and weeds and things had to be burned off. And we see that in Hebrews 6, verse 8. The field has to be burned off. We're the field. We're the soil. He plants it in, a, in us. It's like each one ha- go, skipping to a different metaphor of, of being born again. We have to be born by God. That seed, that word has to plant in us and then germinate, sprout, and grow. And that's the work of the Holy Spirit. It's what Paul is, is, is speaking here uh, is of the whole view, the whole view of hum- all of humanity, at all of time, really, because it's the work of God in the realm of, of God. Thank but you. each of us, each of us has, to, has to have that happen within us. We do not affect our own birth. We, the soil does not choose when the seed is going to be cast into it. That is all the work of God and Christ. And just like uh, each of us being born in different times, we, we, we come into this. And it is a receiving, but it is God who prepares us and affects the, the receiving. And um, that, that's just the, the, another aspect of the work that Paul is not really addressing in this chapter. Thank I you. Hope, appreciate that. I hope that helps. Charlie? Roger, does that answer your question? Uh, yes, it sure did. And I really appreciate that comment about 1 Corinthians 10 and bar- burning off the uh, the weeds, uh, et cetera, so you can work the soil. Good point. Good point. Yeah. Thank you. And that's, you know, God has to plow through us sometimes or, or, or has to um, burn over us or a number of things yeah, because a, a lot of our lives have been like the, the trail, the, the path that is packed down. We have, we've been people have been so stomped on in their life they become hard soil and yeah. seed can't do that but boy you can go through with a, with a plow and plow up those paths and then it's ready to receive or yeah. you said like right. the burning off the fiery trials yeah <laughs> we shouldn't be surprised at the fiery trials okay charles i was going to say that's one of the things that's frustrating about reading the bible and just in an English translation, is that this many thing coming around, and they don't even say the many, which is in right. the original. Right. Uh, and uh, it's like they purposely want to make them ambiguous, you know? Yeah. <laughs> you know, what, uh, what is clear in the original. Yeah. To continue to perpetuate that the church only will be saved. The first fruits, the priesthood people are here to be a blessing as long as they can, and then they get raptured away and the world gets trashed. Yeah. Uh, but what is when Jesus says he's given his life a ransom for many, Jonathan, again, of ambiguity. Um, Kate, can you give us more enlightenment on what he's saying there? Well, a ransom. The idea was to to buy buy something back out of uh, slavery mm-hmm. or um, or uh, debt, you know, things of that nature. Then and he, this once again is the same, just a different word picture of the work of Christ. Um, if if people were sold into slavery, like humanity is in debt slavery right now, um, he came to ransom us to pay off our debts, you might say, you know, and that's not paying a debt to God, it's paying, it's it, the idea, all of the examples I maintain in scripture 
are relate to the human experience. You know, uh, the people could sell themselves into slavery, uh, even within in the law uh, uh, in within Israel when they they needed they couldn't pay their bills. You know, whatever. Well, I'll, I'll work for you or whatever. But there were uh, either the uh, kinsman redeemer could come and pay the debt off and uh, and then they were free. So it's just a term, another term for liberation or being free from that which was holding us in, that was squashing our life and so forth. So I see that as something for here, not something that God needs to have paid to him or anything like that. It's just like the word atonement, which is a whole other subject. But if to understand atonement, I think number one, <clears throat> the word, the Hebrew word was first used when, when uh, Noah spread, covered over the ark with jo jo Jonathan? Yes. Um, can, can um, I think with getting down the, the explanation of atonement might take you a little while to do it, to, okay. do, it, to do it justice. Um, because I you. think it needs to be fleshed out more than yeah. just to throw a couple thoughts out right now. Uh, I right. get a, I get a few other people that would like to um, ask you a question. So, um, Andrew, you were waiting. You're muted. You have to unmute yourself, Andrew. Okay. That's something that I've thought about for a long time. How many of you are if, are involved in churches or mainline denominations? Or do you worship independently? Probably half and half. Half and half. Probably. So given that you're almost almost every denomination posits this idea of eternal damnation, right? Which I cannot see that being consistent with this message. I mean, this is very clear, and there are many others that bring out the universality of the salvation of Christ. Mm -hmm. But it's still, it's still, I still ask the question, what does it mean if someone doesn't convert in this life? And it's not clear what happens after, after that event, if they die without repenting or making a commitment. So what, what happens? I, uh, to try to get, get a short answer, which is hard for me, <laughs> Romans 11.36, out of him, out from the midst of him, through the midst of him, and with that, that second phase here, think Acts 17.28, in him we live and move and have our being, okay, through the midst of him, and literally into the midst of him are all things. Now that little that's one of my favorite scriptures because that's just a thumbnail sketch of the whole plan of God. We came out from him. We passed through him. He's with us. We're in the midst of him. And we return unto him. Another thing is Jesus Christ in, in Hebrews. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and for the ages. So he's... He's the Jesus Christ means the anointed Savior. He's the same yesterday, today, in our day, and in the next life for those. They will deal with him. And this gets into a lot of other things to, to realize that where we read of fire in the scripture, it, it's a symbol for the action, the work of God in purifying us, in doing what needs to be done. And uh, so it's it's just uh, I, I I could go farther, but I'll try to keep it close. I hope that addresses that. We we come to God, and and we we stand before Christ, who He's not holding our trespasses against us. If you read that in Second Corinthians five nineteen, not holding our trespasses against us. You know, and when when we stand before Him. We come to life in our own time, when mm -hmm. it's right for us. And that the, be, yeah, the through, through the ages. Is, yeah, the implication is that, so if you hear about most catechisms or most, uh, most messages coming from a typical denomination, it's you're only 
justified if you repent or believe. So before that, you're under wrath, according to the interpretation of of various passages, which means that you're not you're not forgiven or justified before God until you made that commitment of faith, which I find it doesn't doesn't quite make sense, especially in light of these other verses, right? If he's going to save everyone. Right. Right. And that's so is is the implication then that God has already forgiven us even if we're we're still rebellious? Yes, he has. Yeah. We are like the prodigal son. Mm -hmm. The prodigal son when he was another uh, the father said my my son was dead. Now he's alive back to us. And all humanity goes through that. That's that's like the prodigal parables of the prodigal is like coming out of Eden and in the very end, we find the heavenly Jerusalem, which is, you know, the, that's the high point. It's it's has garden aspects. There's a tree of life on both sides of the river of life, and so forth. And so, that's that's where we come to. He has already done that. He's not holding it against us. We need to become alive to it, and we are called. Uh, in Second Corinthians five, Paul has says we've been given the ministry of reconciliation or of bringing the word of life to change people from being other than what they are. Thank the you, Zach. Christ. Thank you. Thank you. Susan, I see your hand is up. OK. Um, uh, Jonathan, you had mentioned something about a new creation and talked about the Old Testament versus the New Testament. Were you referring to 2 Corinthians 5.17, where it says, you have yes. become a new creation? I've always thought about that being, you know, the old man versus the new man. So could you expand on that a little bit? Well, <clears throat> there's, yeah, and a lot of that is in the translation. There's, a, we have to supply a verb in that verse. And the King James and most of them said, if any man be in Christ, he is. That, that there's no he is in the Greek text. So other translations, and I have followed with, is rather than supplying he is, there is. Because it right follows then, the old things passed away. Well, what passed away? It was the old covenant. We read that in Hebrews, you know, that's gotten old and it's, it, it's passed away. Something better. We're, 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 we've, we've changed from death unto life. And that is something that happened through Christ. That was not, sure, we experience it individually. So you can say, uh, you know, I'm in Christ. I am a new creation. That is true, you know. But if you see the broader view, and others have translated it this way, not just me, that if someone was in the Christ, and Paul was, Christ himself was, Jesus was, there is a new creation the old things have passed away. What in the world are we talking about? The old things, the old religion, the old covenant, the old way of relating to God and, and, and that, you know, he's far distant. No, he's right here with us. He is within us. I, Jesus said, I'm going to come and make my home with you, in you. That is the new. The new has come, it says there. So. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Randy. Um, yeah, just a real quick comment, and then, and uh, Jonathan, if you want to comment on it, and may explain it a little more fully and stuff. Um, just as in Romans five, they leave out the definite article which was there in the Greek. So I find it interesting that in Hebrews nine twenty seven, they insert a definite article which was not in the Greek, when they say it's pointed to man once to die, and after this, the judgment makes it sound really ominous, rather right. than after this judgment, yeah, which um, makes it a lot more palatable and understandable as opposed to, you know, divine sentence of eternal torment. So I don't know, do you, do you encounter the same casualness with the different article in other places too? Oh, yes. Yeah. And, and you can say that there are times when the context can can kind of suggest that, um, but the translators 
translate through the lens of their theology. All of them do. I, you know, I, I, had, I couldn't help but do that uh, myself, but this is why giving multiple renderings, some I didn't care for as much, and yet I thought, well, that's, that's a real viable way of saying it, the Greek here. I'm going to put it out there for not, this isn't just my translation, but give as much as I can to the reader to take to the Holy Spirit and say what's going on here. But yeah, that's that is a, a very good, a very good thing uh, that you've pointed out there, and uh, and also the another thing that's so important I think is that we have an, uh, a a very wrong um, understanding of judgment. One of my favorites is that Jeremiah, when the, when my judgments are in the land, the the people Isaiah. will Isaiah uh, will learn righteousness. You know. Mm -hmm. Judgment is a decision. The word means, crisis, uh, is a separating, a dividing, an evaluation, and coming to a decision, like a judge would, like Solomon did, you know, okay, well, whose baby is this? You know, you come to this and you make a decision. And I see as, as I see that happening all the time. I didn't, I, throughout my, our lives, Linda and I, of raising our children, we didn't wait till they were 21 and say, okay, now you're going to get a judgment for everything you did wrong. You know, a judgment is, <laughs> yeah, thanks, Jess. <laughs> uh, a, a judgment is a course correction. And, and, and if we realize that God so loves us, even though there is, John 336 says, yes, if, if we're not there, his, his wrath, but wrath has a very broad uh, semantic range. It, it can start from the swelling of, of the bud to flower, produce fruit, or, or the passion of, of love, of human love, all the way to anger and wrath. So you have to, if you read John 3.36, the wrath of man, King James is abiding on these people who are, are non-compliant <laughs> and unbelieving. Well, what is, what is that? Go back up in, in that same chapter for God so loves and accepts may the just, world. May I just yeah. add to something that you said, course correction, and mm -hmm. it's everything that you were talking about earlier. The way pointed out is toward redemption. That's right. Is toward to the tree of life. And that's God's decision. He made that judgment in Christ. That's right. And Christ came to fulfill everything. So everything has been accomplished. It's just when we wake up. And Randy, I, I just wanted to make a note. Like what we have personally shared since we've been here, we have met family members of those who wrote, who were involved in the writing of like uh, the, the Steps to Salvation. And it's interesting because <coughs> they were lawyers. So those scriptures were put in terminology of like a law or a court case. Well, if you were to die tonight, you know, you come, you need to make a decision. So you can see where that law and even in the natural sense, lawyers came in and interpreted the scriptures and said, here's the plan of salvation. <laughs> and I think that's been something that has obscured the reality of what Jonathan's translation is pointing out, that there is a way pointed out. And all you need to do is abide in that way and, and, the case is clear that there's salvation and forgiveness and redemption. And God doesn't change his mind about that because Christ finished the work. I'm it's finished. Mm -hmm. Amen. I think that is good, Linda. I agree. Uh, I just want to make a comment myself real quick. Um, I think that one of the questions that comes up a lot when, when, when people are, especially for the first time, <laughs> In, in, in from a traditional Christian perspective, when you're looking at Romans 5, um, it can't obviously mean what it says or the way it plainly reads in some other translation, because some translate, I won't spend the time reading them, like the Weymouth, for example, and others. It, it says it very plainly, as in Adam all die, even so in Christ, all should be made alive. The same all that died in Adam is the same all that would be made alive in Christ. That's right. Okay. Right. Uh, that's really what it teaches. This is what this is really all about. Yes. But in the, even David uh, even David Bentley Hart, in his, uh, the New Testament, his New Testament translation, he has a whole section in the footnotes of that Romans 5 
where he goes into great detail to reason much say the same thing that Jonathan is saying. Uh, and, and I've seen other scholars do the exact same thing. As much as even those scholars that are anti ultimate reconciliation, they, they will admit that Romans 5 is an enigma for them because Romans 5 does teach a universal salvation, but yes. it can't be true. So there's something wrong. It's, it's one of those anomalies in their theology and they don't like to go. Those who are honest, those who are truly honest with what the Greek says will admit that, yeah, it seems like Paul is saying, yeah, it, it doesn't just seem it. That's what he's saying. Absolutely. You know, we who have come to see it because our grid, our paradigm, for example, is not just Romans 5. This idea of the reconciliation permeates the whole, the whole scriptural revelation once you look at all these different themes that relate to it. Mm -hmm. And what I was just going to say, and I'll keep it real short, is that those people who, you know, those of us, all of us who first come into even just contemplate the idea of ultimate reconciliation, um, you know, a, a lot of things, will, a lot of folks will say, well, well, why, why preach the gospel then? You know, or why serve Jesus if everyone's going to get... Because I think what we miss is we miss the significance of what salvation is really all about. Mm -hmm. You know, we think of salvation as some kind of a get out of jail free card. We think of salvation as some kind of escape from a, an eternal place of suffering, which in the first place doesn't exist. It's just not biblical. And so there's, that's not what we're being saved out of. We're being saved out of sin, out of ourselves. And, and why do I say this? Um, okay, I'm just going to just give you two scriptures, um, one from Paul and one from Peter. Okay, in, in Paul, in Galatians 3.8, um, he, 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 he preaches the gospel. He says in a simple way, in one verse, he says, Scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham, saying, In you all the nations shall be blessed. Now, Peter in Acts 3.26 quotes the same passage, except he quotes the, the, the passage from Genesis 18.18 18 instead of 12.3, but basically the same one. But this one says, and, and God uh, said to Abraham, in you all the nations shall, all the families of the earth, I'm sorry, shall be blessed. So P Paul's calling that the gospel, the good news. The good news is all the nations shall be blessed. And then Peter says the yeah, takes it to the next level when he says and he's speaking to the jews he says to you first that's the next verse after he quotes that passage from genesis he says to you first god sent him to bless you in turning every one of you from your evil ways so he it, he actually expresses he defines if you will what the blessing actually is and what is that blessing that Paul called the gospel, the blessing is God's going to transform us. He's going to, and that's exactly what Jonathan has been trying to get across with what's happening in, in when this, this idea of justification. So that God's not leaving us on our sin. He's, he's, he's committed to transforming us. That's why in, Paul could say in, in Philippians 1, 6, he who has begun a good work in you will bring it to completion. That's why he could also say in Philippians 2.13, God is at work in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. That's why John could say, oh, his commands are not burdensome because God is at work. So, so yeah, and, and why preach the gospel if this is true? Because people are hurting. When Jesus saw the crowd, he was moved to compassion because they were distressed and dispirited like she put out a shepherd. And what, what the first thing he said, he said, pray, the Lord of the harvest, that he sent forth workers into his heart people are hurting yes. people need hope this so i mean we can we can believe what paul is saying we can believe in the victorious gospel that's not yeah. going to give us a license to sin i'm sorry i went beyond what i wanted to say <laughs> diane <laughs> that's awesome that's great jerry diane yeah and, and thank you jerry I, that was good um Jonathan, I want to thank you for being here and, and all that you've shared today. You talked about the indefinite articles. Um, and I wonder, it seems to me that that, that happens with a lot of small words, um, prepositions, for, by, into, toward, you know, from uh, many times, like, it seems, if I remember right, in Genesis, 
the earth was cleansed for man. It wasn't a judgment against man, but it was for man. Um, it describes the stench. And if you've, I've heard of people that have been near where Holocaust people were buried and how even now the stench from all the carnage is still there, yeah. you know, and, and the condition of the world at that time. And, but most translations, you don't get that essence that, that the earth was cleansed for man, you know, or many times when, when talking about God, is he for us or is he against us? And, yeah. and I, I wish I had a, a clearer understanding of all of those other small words like that, but so. Well, this is why in, in my translation of the New Testament, um, where the context will support more than one reading of some of those small words, I offer them there for just to be here. Okay, here are the tools, a translator aside. So often a, a, the, when a noun is meant to be um, an indirect object, uh, it uses particular form and, and but th that form has a multiple functions. And so, this there's I think there's there's built into in my years of, of, of studying the Greek text there is a certain amount of ambiguity there number one because I think he didn't want us to build creeds and nail it down or put it in stone once again it's it's mm -hmm. it's so that we can ponder and say oh lord it could be this you know many places the word god is in this particular case where it's usually two is the preposition that is chosen two when it could be four it could be the um, in, um, instrumental dative uh, case that's just a uh, I shouldn't even put that no, gr that's fine. grammar term but it, 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 it can be by it can be in it could be two it could be with and if you understand that and read it and just stop and say Oh wow! A lot of this is by God. It's not to Him, and it's it's indicating that God is the working here. But then also, well, and it's in God. Oh yeah, we do live in God, don't we? And and it's with God. Oh yeah, we're co-laborers with God, aren't we? You know, and it just it just it's like taking a diamond and letting letting that gem gem flash all the different colors as you look at it, and not just have one little thing that is laid out. That's why we have so many translations. Yes. Um, Diane, to your point, because Jonathan and I have a lot of discussions and I hear exactly what you're saying. And I've been so blessed because of his time in the word and bringing out the different nuances. For example, the word faith, when he'll read any, any just find faith, by faith you're saved, you know, all this. And then he'll say to faith for faith, of faith. And when Christ is involved with all of that and we're in him and he is in us, this just, this just explodes. I, I, you know, I can't explain it, but just exactly what you're talking about, the jot and the tittle sort of nuances, the of, for, and by. Mm -hmm. When Jonathan has looked at the language and I don't use all the fancy words that he does, <laughs> but he says that, okay, this is valid to put of, to, for, and by. And for me, when we're in discussion or just reading it, and he'll remind me, Linda, that's not your faith. That's the faith of Christ that you just simply step into and receive. Yeah. And so what that does is it's like, oh, my gosh, that takes away my working up of faith. This is huge, you guys. This is huge. This is when you really recognize that he who created everything indwells us he is pleased to find his habitation within us and it's so exciting it goes off the map just like the first miracle that jesus performed at the wedding why is he taking water pots you know it, it was like earlier the discussion was well before we had the old covenant now we have the new covenant now you see the son the new priest coming on the scene 
And he is setting the stage for the new covenant with the best wine. It's, it's exciting to look at in when Mary just said, whatever they, he tells you to do, go do it. He's kind of like, well, woman, this is not my time and all this kind of stuff. But to me, when I've looked at that over and over again, the first miracle and everything that it was saying to the old order and the old arrangement, it was saying serving notice, you know, like it was this way before. Now we've got the new wine. Hello. And what do we need for the new wine? We need the new wine skins. And that's what our father is all about. It, it's like we're in those exciting times because as we see it and he reveals it to us, we can step into it. And these living waters become rivers of wine. Think about it. And, and why should we care? Like Jerry was saying earlier, it's because we can help share and spread the joy of our salvation. We can pull out the essence of that water, but now through the Holy Spirit and the new revelation that he is giving us in these times, it's further. The kingdom keeps growing. It keeps expanding. So what does that mean about you and I? We are going to keep growing. We are going to keep expanding. And, and it's beautiful. And it's so beyond what I can even think. But it's like, we've got to stay in the river. We have to let the river teach us. We have mm -hmm. to see that it's changing into wine. We have to see that we are part of that tree of life. And yes, it is for the nations, not just discipling individuals, nations. And what does our world need right now? We need more than anything, a discipling of the nations and the giving of the bread and the giving of the new wine to erase and eradicate this old arrangement that has kept man in, in, in a death hold and a stranglehold. We all see it. We all know it. We're all grieving and groaning with creation. But that's why he has called us with, it, we don't do it in ourselves. He ju we just are recipients, like what Jonathan was talking earlier about the receiving of the gospel, the good news. That good news, it's water. But you know what? All these churches that have been watered down and just, you know, kind of not really participating as the ecclesia with the heavenly Jerusalem, it's like he's changing that water into wine. We're going to see it. I mean, I believe it. Anyway, that was a long comment. <laughs> no, no, thank you. Yeah, that was good. I get excited. <laughs>